Hello, hello everybody and good afternoon. 2.15 in a Monday slot, you are very welcome to the Curious Coaches Club here today. We have had months and months of different topics. We've covered safeguarding, inclusion, diversity, social learning, debriefing, planning, the step model. We even had some athletes on. Last week we had some physios on, returning to, to training and all of those now encompassed in our five to eight year old coaching session. So what does it look like? Um, what are we supposed to expect if we were joining the coaching world for the first time and we're given this group of under sixes, under sevens, or just this group of children, or we're indeed in the primary school space and we're teaching that age group. Uh, what should we expect? So this session today with our wonderful guests, will help us navigate what to expect from children at this age, um, our priorities as coaches when working with this age, and I know the word fun and enjoyment is going to come in multiple times, and what to include in our practice design. So hopefully elements of self-reflection we'll talk about today, some questions to support you in understanding how you evaluate uh, a practice session, a training session for that age group, um, and have a really good session. I don't know how we're going to fit it all in 60 minutes, but... For those of you, Darren's smiling already, um, for those of you who haven't joined us uh, before, we do have a chance later in the week. So we have a connected coaches session. It's a kind of a form that runs at the back end of our website. It's a community platform for you to engage with. And then um, our community is a practice run. So if there's something today that you didn't get a chance to ask a question about, didn't get clarity on, you can have a dive into the forum on, on connected coaches or indeed join one of our communities of, of practice later in the week. So, enough for me, our wonderful guests. Darren is joining us all the way from Australia. He's still awake. It's almost in the 11 o'clock mark at this point. <laughs> but as I've heard, he has three under the age of five. So he's smiling. This is his downtime. <laughs> um, as you can see from the slide, head of coach and volunteer and development, huge area involved obviously in the coaching of the age group that we have today as well. Um, Jackie, absolute pleasure to have you with us today. Extensive experience um, in and out of, of um, in, uh, out and out the pitch, but also in an early years capacity from an academic point of view. And then Anthony, um, the, the strength and energy it must take to be involved on a daily basis in that primary PE space. <laughs> Big thumbs up before we even start. So we've got a really kind of diverse amount of lenses on this topic today. I would encourage, as always, to put some chats, uh, some thoughts, some experiences, some questions in the chat box. And if our uh, panelists have time during the session to pick it up, they'll pick it up and we'll go with it. If not, at the halfway mark stage, I will uh, stop and have a have a check in with you, see what's going on. So. And uh, the pit stop. So usually we have a little bit of um, on the next slide, we'll have a look at what way the session will look. So you can make some notes on that and see where exactly this session is going. Characteristics, you know, there's a broad sense. Everybody develops at different stages. But in general, and from our experience of our panelists, what characteristics of children age uh, five to eight should we expect? Priorities for those coaches working in that space or hoping to work. Then we'll take a halftime pit stop and continue on with implications for practice, activities, environment, and culture, and then finish off with a summary, because uh, we'll, we'll definitely need a net to catch all these gems. Final thoughts, key messages, questions, and answers. So I'm going to catch a breath here, but I am going to go and, uh, in a flip question today. Darren, if I could come to you first, ask you the question which I'll ask all three, um, what teacher or coach inspired you? Look, it would have to be my secondary uh, physical education teacher, my high school PE teacher. Um, he was a, a gentleman who uh, taught me from probably year seven, you know, 12, 13 years of age up to year 11, I would say, uh, 16 years of age. Um, energetic, positive, uh, friendly, really easy to get, up, to get along with. But he certainly could manage his classrooms very, very well without the need to yell. Uh, without the need, the need to raise his voice. And in fact, I, I, I do remember the one time I can remember in those five years or so that I had him as a teacher where he did raise his voice, you could, you could have heard a pin drop. It, it, it was so effective. He, he saved it for, for that moment, I thought. But um, he had such an influence on me. My, my background is physical education teaching. Uh, that's my qualification. And um, I think that's why. He's the reason why I went into, into PE teaching. Uh, I, I really, I'm really glad that years after I left school, I actually wrote him a letter 
and um, mentioned to him the influence that he had had on me and, and where, where I'd come uh, and, and oh, wow. you know, the things that I'd done since leaving school, which I, I, I highly recommend that to anybody to, to, to write back to your mentors. You know, and and he, he got back to me and absolutely loved hearing from me. It, it was just a wonderful thing. So, yes, very, very influential. Oh, what a start. Lovely, Darren. Thank you so much. Um, Anthony, if I could come to you next. Yeah, similar to Darren, but mine was a primary school teacher. So I had a teacher called Mr. Smith and he was 20 stone. He looked like a, a teacher that wouldn't love PE and I got moved into his class and lo and behold, he was a rugby player and he had the biggest impact on me. I wasn't the most academic student at the time and he took us out onto the field for the very first PE lesson. I was just blown away. It was a, sort of the first P lesson outside we'd had because we'd moved from key stage one to key stage two. There was no more old fashioned gymnastics jumping horse. We had hockey sticks out for the first time. And then that grew in year three, four, five, and six. He always sort of kept an eye on what I was doing, made sure I was sort of on task. And he was a, a real influence in my primary school. And then along the secondary school, there were, there were many more that would check in. I think, like Darren said, the ones that the P teachers that you connect with that have that connection, regardless of whether it's they just know your name before you even walk into the classroom, whether it's they taught your brother, your sister, as soon as you've got that connection, the P teachers are always tend to have that warm sort of culture around them. I think that's the biggest thing with Mr. Smith at the time. And similar to Darren, he actually messaged me. He he got in contact with me on social media about four or five years ago and sort of said how are you and like, the peer group we were in, how we were doing, and we then had a conversation around that, and like you say, it was very humbling, I think, for him, but for me, it was like, look, you were a key influence, thank you, sort of, it was like a thanks from my point of view to him, so huge influence, Mr Smith, what a guy. Oh, wow. I think it's it's interesting already, like those words that we will probably trickle through the session. I'm sure they will actually, but even repeating the fun, the positivity, the feeling valued, knowing your name, checking in, those key things that we haven't even and probably won't go near the tech tech kind of things, even at this age, where to stand, positions, techniques to things. Um, but yeah, it's really important, like who's in front of us is what we always talk about, that child-centered approach or person-centered approach. Um, Jackie, if I could come to you. Um, I'm going to kind of flip it a little bit. So I'll look at it from um, a coaching perspective uh, because I started, when I started coaching, I think that there was two main influences specifically in regard to um, this age group. Um, so one um, is somebody called Jim Kelman, who um, was quite high up in relation to coach education. Um, and he kind of started me on my coaching journey. Um, he kind of, I, I looked to him kind of for the standards that he set but also in relation to the knowledge that he had um, and how he, inter uh, again, it's how he interacted with different people in regard to the different, um, where they were on their journey, where they were on their pathway. And um, so I think it was, he actually, it, it was, he got to know you as an individual and then understood you in relation to your own personal journey rather than the whole group. Um, and then later on, I think, one of the main influences in relation to this age group has been Pete Sturgis at the FA. Um, and I've been really fortunate enough to work alongside him and be part of like a working group with him in relation to developing stuff for the foundation phase. Um, but he's just like an inspiration. Um, and it, I'm, I'm fortunate or I'm in a fortunate position to actually be able to work with him and work alongside him because if you've ever met him, you can just see his enthusiasm for this age group and how he connects with this age group. And and, and he's inspired me in regard to working with the foundation phase. Wow. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant start. And really important question. And I love the fact that all three of you either connected or are fed back to these uh, mentors and in, uh, instrumental people in your journeys. Um, I think there's a couple of things in the chat box that maybe steer, will steer the session today, even though we have a, a plan laid out and some questions. And one is, we can't avoid it, managing the social and physical distancing of five-year-olds um, in the return to play. And we might um, mull over that during the, the early questions that we have and get to that at the halftime mark. But if I could come to you, um, Jackie, first. Characteristics. Now, broad pain stroke, as we know, 
you know, children develop at different pace, physically, mentally, we're talking about, uh, you know, cognitive development, how many words they're taking in and processing. But from your experience and in designing programs, the early years experience from an academic point of view, what are the characteristics that we should expect from a five to eight year old? Um, so um, from my view, um, they will start, be starting to develop those fundamental movement skills, so the, the coordination. Um, that their attention span will be limited um, and they will be able to remember two or three kind of items. So it's not, don't overload them with information because their brains won't be able to process it all. Um, it, it might take them time as well. So a characteristic might, it might take time to remember or retain that information and then to actually implement what you're asking them. So again, it's that so much because it will take time. Um, they, can they can't decipher complex information, so it goes back to not overloading them. Um, and also be careful because they will actually copy and mimic you. Um, so if you're doing something they shouldn't be doing or might not be deemed appropriate in front of them, they might actually do that. And then when you try to chastise them, they'll be there again, you'll confuse them and the brain won't be able to comprehend that because of the complexity of the two issues. Um, hand and eye coordination, it's limited and it's growing. Um, so again, be mindful that um, if you're asking them to do throwing and catching exercises, sometimes that might not actually be achievable for certain um, children at this age group. Um, and visually, um, their perceptions are not developed fully. Um, so they're kind of some of the characteristics that I would deem quite important at this age group. Or oh, maybe one more. They're not yeah. necessarily empathetic at this age either. Yes, it's developing at that point, isn't it? There's um, a lot of different statistics that we can pull on around um, you know, child's brain and development. And uh, one of the ones I read recently is 90% developed by the age of five. Um, but that really doesn't tell us about much about kind of the interactions that we might encounter. And um, it, this picture here, Anthony, if I could pull on you to give us a little bit of an experience you know, kind of insight into why we've used this one for for your representation. Yeah, so I was on a staff um, a staff meeting and we were talking about the PE journey, as it were, and it then got onto this picture. And I think this picture really highlights the characteristics and the different levels of children that you would have in your lesson. So if you look at the picture your spot on the bottom right of the picture as it is on the screen you've got the sole car which you know that could be then one minute then you look at the one at the top who's proud of what he's achieved that can be then five minutes later you've got the element of teamwork the two sitting on the branch you've got one swinging off the tree if you look at the top left you've got one at the top that's not helping at all you've got the sulker at the top who's achieved all that he wants to but it looks like they want to achieve more so I find this picture is a fascinating and a brilliant visual picture to show what the characteristics of, of children are like. Um, some of the big ones that I find in PE, especially in a school setting, is the fun and the energetic side of it. So as soon as I walk into the classroom or PE teacher walks to the classroom, we try and promote that we are the fun people. We are the people that as soon as they see us, instantly the smile is on the children's faces we are the the sellers of lifelong participation in sport so i think we i almost try and brand us as the sellers to the children so as soon as they see us they're smiling which will then lead on to as soon as you've got them in the space that they're working in you've naturally got their attention because they, they want to listen they want to see what you're doing you are you are the fun person who who holds everything key to them at that time and that's before you even get the equipment out. So that the fun, the fun and the energetic side is, is is key. And I think for myself, it's that willingness to engage with a five-year-old, a seven-year-old to what they want to hear as well. I think Jackie mentioned about the individual before. I think knowing your children, as we all know, is crucial regardless of the age. But at this age range, it is crucial to understand how how they they try and think and how 
one minute they're throwing and catching the ball, the next they're telling you about a story that they got an ice cream for the ice cream van yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm giggling. A few stories came to my head over there. Darren, I see, I see you nodding, and I'm sticking around this characteristic from your experience. Um, where do you think you know children are at um, between this this age category of five to eight? Yeah, I think they need a real purpose to perform. They need a real tangible reason to be doing things. So. A skillful coach or teacher will uh, not just ask them to do something that they can see no reason for. Um, you know, you will use stories, you will use games, you will use fun competition to actually um, uh, motivate them, to inspire them to, to undertake um, activities. So. Uh, a teacher or a coach of this particular age group needs to be very creative, innovative and, and very good when it comes to um, uh, presenting novel ac activities, I would say. Brilliant, brilliant. And I mean, that leads us into the priorities. But I think one of the daunting parts, if we could pause there for a moment, is the, the pressure around the word to be creative. Um, because I, I only had a smaller stint about two or three years in London before I came into this role in primary school spaces with teachers who hadn't had positive experiences um, in, in their PE sessions and that unfortunately carried into the playground. So they were there all kitted out, they had the practice plan that they downloaded from somewhere in their hand, but transferring, as you say, and I'm, I'm just holding on that Darren around the story, transferring this into a story is a real daunting experience. So they tend to lean then towards maybe a little bit of an intro that because the warm up is safer and then getting someone else to lead, which is no harm, absolutely. But um, what, what advice could you maybe give around that creativity space? I think just looking at activities um, and, and trying to, to find, knowing your, your, your students, knowing your, the, the, the young athletes and what may be interesting, interesting them at that, at that age. Um, I, I, I recently, having three kids under the age of five, was watching Peppa Pig with them. And um, there's this Peppa Pig ep episode that, I, that just really took my interest. It was brilliant, called Gym Class where the, the instructor of the day uh, tells Pepper and the classmates that they've not entered a gym, but they've entered a jungle and they're little explorers, uh, you know, on an adventure. And rather than getting them walk across a beam, he gets them to walk across a, a river, you know, that's at, at, at night time and the wind's blowing. So yeah, it, that's, that's the type of thing I'm, I'm talking about, you know, coming up with, with stories and, and, and scenarios for the kids, I suppose. That's I think fantastic. can I just Go on jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that story of of the Peppa Pig. I think you've got to have that part when working with age is You've got to know what they're watching, what what they like, and that that language that they're going to relate to. And walking over a bench is mundane to them. Crossing a river where there's wind blowing, there's rain splashing, and they can visualize like, could have seen it on the TV. It, it's key that that whole language concept is then rushed away because they're, they're relating it to what they've seen in their own experiences. I think it is crucial. Yeah, it brought me to a funny, funny story when I was in a reception class and we had limited equipment into the store, um, chatting with the teacher about what we could use and we had the typical beanbag ball scenario if we have those. And then there was a few old skipping ropes out in the back. And I said, right, well, what can we do with these? And as we were taking them out, one, uh, one five-year-old turned around, or yeah, just going five, actually, four and a half, turned around and goes, oh, snakes. <laughs> I was like, yes, snakes. So we took all of the different ropes between the two of us giggling. And, we, and she, all of a sudden, we, you know, you had a whole... Um, you had a whole session on flight and landing and balance right there and hopping over the river and the snakes are in the river and um, and really if anyone was to take a picture it was just a you know bog standard few pieces of equipment on the ground but they were in an adventure you know um, but uh, yeah absolutely brilliant so um, priorities for a coach so we'll get to kind of practice design a little bit later and we'll bring back to life the being creative as a coach and a teacher with practice design and how that differs to the environment itself, or at least correlates in some way to the, the bigger picture of the session. But what, what do priorities, Jackie, if I could come to you and you could pick one of those off there, what's important for a coach to know going into this space now that they have an idea of the characteristics or somewhat of the, the age that's in front of them, what do they need to do? Um, I think it, um, I'll touch maybe on two of them um, because 
you as their coach or their teacher will become quite a big influence on them. So that attachment theory is quite big um, at this age group. Obviously, their parents or carers that they're with 24-7 um, will be a big influence on them, but you'll, you will become part of that attachment theory for them. Um, so set, being a good role model, um, understanding that um, they are individuals, and then understanding or having that need for structure. Um, so I think um, Darren mentioned it be before, like having a plan, um, but not necessarily going to plan, if that makes sense. I think you need to be quite flexible with this age group and expect the unexpected. Um, so you need to have structure, but you can't be too structured. Need to have structure, but you can't be too structured. Brilliant, Jackie. Love it. Um, I'll note that down in the summary when we gather. So, um, Darren, if I could jump over to you around priorities. Any of these uh, stick out for you or any examples that you could provide around um, priorities on that list of um, things for a coach to, to get ready for the session? Yeah, I think that um, practice for this age group needs to feel like it is, it is play. So that word play really stands out to me there. Um, I think it's worthwhile uh, watching young kids at play and notice what what they do, um, and and try and transfer. Even though a coaching session will will never be strictly free play, try and transfer some of those things into your session that you see kids doing when they are are at free play. Um, so I, I would say it, a huge priority is is to make sessions playful for kids. Yeah, and I, I like to, hold, again, just hold on words that are, are popping out to me here. And it's probably something we can address later in the self-reflection or um, reflecting on a session for the coach yourself is notice you mentioned, Darren. And um, I know, you know, personally, and maybe Anthony, I could come for you uh, to the answer this in the PE sessions, but noticing what the trends and behaviours are. So understanding that, you know, there's all the different kind of emotion and social development that's happening along with the physical um, and cognitive. So what what kind of things would you look to notice and note about the people you have in front of you in a session that could help you um, plan and organize and enjoy the sessions? Yeah, I think once you know, I'm quite fortunate that I know my class and I'm sure coaches will know the groups that they're working with quite well. So they will have a general feel of whether it's going right or not. The things that I look out for in the P lesson is I look which children are engaged and which ones are not engaged because I saw in the chat box there was a question around imaginative play and some don't engage with that. So if we're doing storytelling, example, like Darren used the pet pig or we're going Dora the Explorer and we're exploring, we're moving around like the different animals and there'll be some that do not buy with it. So it's about having that conversation or finding what those children like and then it might be you flip it around. So the following week it won't be imaginative play it might be something that is just round to that child. That might then create an attachment towards the PE lesson and imagination and the play aspect could come back to it. Um, so the, the play side of it is, is crucial. I certainly look for the fun aspect, which children are enjoying it, and also how active they are within the lessons. Most children that I tend to find between the ages of five and eight, the ones that are going, the ones that are physically active, the ones that are moving, they're the ones that have the fun. So you'd focus on them and then the ones that maybe are not quite engaged, it's having that that resource, that knowledge, that that language so you can include them within that. So they're the, the two specific groups that I, I look at. And then at the end of I think the end of the lesson is everyone knows about reflection. I think that's key to the lesson. I think it's you could argue it's one of the most important parts of the lesson. So when we finish the lesson, just a general Q and A, what did you like? And naturally, you get the kids, oh, I liked everything. It was brilliant. And it's looking at the ones that didn't engage and then having that conversation again with them. Which bit did you not like? Which bit would you change? If you was a PE teacher, what would you do differently? That's the key question that I often ask. It's now common practice within our school. Well, if you was Mr. Land, what would, what would you do? So they're the things that I look out for in the lesson. And it just, that, all that combines with a flow, I think, doesn't it? I think you just get a general feel and a flow for what's worked and what hasn't. Brilliant. Uh, uh, absolutely. And the importance there of filtering into the, 
the self-reflection part. Um, Jackie, there's a question that's come in just on the back of a comment you made around attachment theory. Um, but before I come to you on getting more information on that, um, Darren, can I get you to, to close off the last priority that you think for coaches would be really important? Um, linking kind of to Anthony's point there around the, the balance of um, the recall and the kind of semantic memory that we try to tap into versus that episodic, that, that memory that we have that's relation to a really good feeling in the session. Really enjoyed that lesson. I really enjoyed, um, you know, whatever they're attributing that to. Um, but I really enjoyed and I'm leaving that session, whether it is going back to a class that they don't particularly enjoy or subject they don't enjoy, but have that feeling that they can bring into the next session. What would you say is the final kind of important priority? Oh, look, I, I, it is, there's a, there's a, a few things that I, I could pick out. Um, but I think keeping the activities extremely engaging is, is and, and, and yes, we talk about kids, kids being active and, and, and that's highly important because this age group is a very energetic uh, age group who wants to be active and engaged. But I think also to that, um, I suggest just whether it, it, you can be active or, and, and you can be engaged also too. So an engagement can be something that um, they are not necessarily active, but they are watching and they are cheering and they are and they are clapping teammates and, and they are doing all of those types of things too. So I, I just think that's a, that's a hugely important area. Oh, brilliant. Thanks so much, Darren. Um, Jackie, just before we move on to the next section, um, could you just give us a little bit of an insight? I see that Nick has posted a link there for people who are interested in diving in, but from your experience, could you give us a little bit more on the attachment theory that people might be able to note down? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, that's, it's a psychological need. Um, so, in, and it's developed quite early. Um, so parents um, or carers and siblings will become part of um, a young person's attachment group, um, but as a significant person within a child's life, so for instance, a teacher, a coach, somebody that they're regularly seeing, you will also become part of their attachment group and you'll become a significant person in supporting them develop. Um, again, it's, it's being that role model um, and they will come and confide in you. Um, so it's, it's looking at the psychological corner um, and how we as coaches or teachers can support the the young play, young I say player sorry young person's growth and development and because they will look to us as being a role model. Brilliant, Jackie. Thank you so much. I think so, the, in that kind of um, ten month on stage, it, what was really um, kind of what really resonated to me about that particular theory was it isn't actually necessarily the person they spend most time with I do. Yeah. The link with the signals and as you've linked to their kind of role models and responding and that kind of sensitivity um, it, it gives them a sense of um, comfort mm -hmm. yeah it, it becomes part of their it's their comfort so you become part of their comfort zone and it, yeah. it's quite key because actually that the attachment develops as they go through their age groups so when they hit a teenage um, their peers will become their primary attachment role model rather than an adult. So it, it's quite quite intricate in regard to how it changes and dips, dips and drops throughout their age group. Thanks, Jackie, for that. Um, pit stop, halfway already. Where's the time going? Um, right, the question that was that was popped in the chat box earlier. Let's go back to that and address that briefly. And, and I'd probably go across the panel. I'll leave J Jackie up a couple of seconds to catch her breath. So either Darren or Anthony to jump in. The question was lingering around um, the kind of social and physical distancing for this particular age group when people resume either in the classroom or on the pitch in the court on the track. Um, I know some of the stuff that's happened poolside already, maybe not in the, the earlier stage of the five and six, but seven and eight year olds have seen some pictures from coaches that I work with of different mechanisms they put in place. But what would you, what would you uh, like to contribute to that question? Um, I'll... Yeah, brilliant. Go on, Darren, do you want to go first? Yeah, look, um, I've, I've only got some really, really specific type um, examples. Um, I mean, I have played, continued to play tag with some kids, but I've utilised, um, you know, halved pool noodles as the item with which 
the children will tag each other, um, which tends to not only um, keep the kids physically distanced, but it also helps prevent collisions and that type of thing. So it's actually a good, a good safety uh, uh, thing to do. Pool noodles are, are a wonderful item to, to use as a coach. Now that's a very, very specific example, but that's, that's I think the type of thing that we have to be thinking about. Brilliant, thanks Darren. Anthony? Yeah, I think being creative with equipment, because what we don't want to do is children to lose the love of PE. So we need to keep the activities as fun and in their eyes as normal as possible. If they're, I've seen lots of coaches do where they segregate them into their own little square. Um, I'm not a personal fan of their own designated areas. I think it, at the start of the lesson, we'll remind the children of the key safety aspects. We'll remind they'd all wash their hands. And I, I um. I use the term, um, the green bubble with the children. You have to say, well, what is the green bubble, Mr. Lambs? Well, what do you think it is? And this is where it gets a bit silly. And then as soon as the first child would shout, it's a fart bubble. <laughs> and that general play aspect, is, as silly as it sounds, it's fantastic for five-year-olds. It is brilliant. They're laughing. They're running, oh, I'm not going in that bubble. Um, again, because the tag games and the, the fundamental movement skills you get from those games, you don't want to lose. So that, that silly language that comes to life, as well as your creative equipment, like with the poo noodles, I think is, is crucial. It's, it's trying to think, like, a, what would a child want to be thinking and playing and what language do they use to keep it fun? And that's, that's the analogy that... Um, I like to use with the age range. Brilliant. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, I got us all giggling there. Um, <laughs> Jackie, anything to add to that? We've got some pool noodles and hula hoop scenarios. We've got some stinky bubbles mm -hmm. uh, and some fun language. Um, anything that you think is important to for our, um, our audience today to, to maybe eat, order, order online or <laughs> Google after the session? I think um, it plays into this age group's hand a little bit, the social distancing, because they, some some of the children will like to be on their own and play on their own. Um, and also in regard to getting the best out of this age group, it's better to work in smaller groups, so in twos and threes. So it kind of plays into your hands. And again, if, like with Anthony and Darren said, in regard to using your imagination, if you can create areas that they can't go into or they can only go into in ones or twos, it will help you in regard to keeping that distance. Um, I think um, like hoops are really good as well. Um, so hoops um, or ropes and flat discs for dividing and dividing areas and let them come up with it. Why, why do we have to come up with it all the time? They've got great imaginations, let them use it. So for me, it'd be giving them a little bit more ownership, um, maybe a bit more free play. So having the equipment there that they can actually utilize. Um, and also working to uh, working in our favour in regard to that small group. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Jackie. I was. Um, we are. It's, it's a brilliant segue into the next session on practice design. And earlier on, we spoke about the coach teacher um, person who's venturing into this coaching world of five to eight um, and, and beyond, really, because it's transferable. Who doesn't love as an adult to have a bit of fun in a session, whether it's through language or equipment? It's just tapping in to maybe the next layer because we've buried ourselves in seriousness over the years. But um, so a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about um, the step model. So mindful as a coach of the, the space you have, the task at hand, the, the equipment that you might use. And we had a list here um, and then uh, people. So the people in front of us. So. Anthony, if I could come to you about the practice design top tips and give us a little bit of insight into this list that you've put together, please. Yeah, so I'll give you, so these are the things that when I'm looking at this age range, these are the things that I like to consider. And it looks like it's a lot, but it's not, it, it all sort of merges together. So the first two, the learn intention, the toolkit is every coach, every teacher will have their focus of what they want to learn. So it might be, the learning intention is to know how to catch a ball. Then the toolkit obviously helps them do that. So, which leads into the creative language. So when I'm teaching, I try and find 
a way of bringing the language to life. For example, when you're catching the ball, lots of children, they have their hands like this and they call it the ready position. We call it spider fingers. So as soon as you say spider fingers, they get their eight fingers and wiggle around like spider's legs. That again leads it into that sort of that fun aspect and that, that language certainly helps. In terms of the equipment, so I see lots of, lots of balls and tennis balls are always used for catching at that age again. And I think we need to try and think, because of their raise, their hand-eye coordinator, their developmental skills, why not use something as simple as a bib? Roll the bib up, scrunch it up, and then if the child is not as engaged or they're struggling to catch it, they will find that, that bib that they can mould it into a small water they want to do it further or faster. If they want to make it go a bit slower, they open it up. So having that equipment, I often find helps also. The progression, lots of children at five to eight, again, we find once they've done their task, they want to know what's next and having the next steps and knowing them linked to what they're learning is, is also a very big part of the plan. So you're almost trying to preempt what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. I think if you know you've got a class of 20, you've got your high flyers, your strivers and your strugglers, knowing at what point of the lesson requires what part of the progression, I think, again, that's key. So you'd have little Jimmy is on stage three catching and you might have Jessica on stage one catching or vice versa. Knowing the strategies and when to implement them for the progression keeps the flow of the lesson. So I think they're the, the key bits. The, but the biggest one from that list for me is the creative language and making it come to life. Chest pass, call it a zombie pass. You see them all moving around like zombies. Um, the overhead pass, that monster throw. Those types of language is fundamental for the children to be engaged in the lesson. And then it's a brilliant conversation to have with their parents when they go home and say, well, what did you do in PE today? We learned about zombies, monsters, spider fingers. And it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant way to engage with the parents also. No. Oh. Fantastic. Again, smiling through that. Um, and I, I think one of the, the fun things and maybe the safe things as well is that, yes, you may need to be creative in the first instance to come up with the spidey fingers or Google and, and find a list. But from my own personal experience, when I was on, on the ground and I did hear that and I'd share spidey fingers or catching raindrops or the claw, whatever it was, they said straight away, oh, but what about this and what about that? So it took me off the hook straight away, one introduction, eased them into something. And then there were different characters with different scenes. One minute we're on the beach, the next minute we're in space. And whilst we are looking at a range where their self-perception is changing between that age, uh, maybe over the cost of seven to nine, um, it is just noticing again and tapping in and in that self-reflection period or reflection of the session, what have you noticed about whom? And um, some questions we'll get into in the in the closed part that might help people with that a little bit more. Um, Darren, any any top tips around practice design for you that you're either seeing here that you could elaborate on or, or yourself outside? Yeah, I, I think um, wherever possible, plan to allow at least in some stages of a lesson or a session for the kids to contribute and take a bit of command. Um, and it can be as, as little as um, choosing the colour of something to uh, designing a, a part of an obstacle course uh, to, um, you know, deciding how far they have to run. So I think that kids, even at this age group, um, love a bit of responsibility and love that you're showing them a bit of trust. And I think if you can plan that into your lesson and how you're going to do that, I think it's really, really worthwhile. And, and again, uh, helps to engage those kids. Brilliant. Thanks, Darren. I've seen there from um, Anita there, which it, it reminded me, she's talked about, I use juggling scarves for catching and the kids love the floatiness and the colours. And she's actually elaborated on that in the Connected Coaches group uh, on a thread called uh, Great Coaching. So if anybody's interested in seeing more games and actions or videos and snapshots of creativity, Anita's one along with a string of others is on that. So um, th thanks for adding to that. Um, Jackie, any anything else from you around practice design that you've used, seen, or shared with the coaches? 
Um, I think in relation to it's building a love for. Um, so in regard to the children that you've got in front of you, you want them to love the game. So whatever game you're doing or it's a PE lesson, you want them to, to, to be really engaged. So you do need to make it real. You do need to make it fun. You do need to make it engaging and you do need to give them some ownership in relation to it. Um, I think what, what I said earlier about you need to be structured, but not too structured but not structured um, is that as a coach in this age group, you need to accept the unexpected and be very flexible and adaptable in your approach in regard to your delivery. So you have got a session plan which is structured and has got clear progression as Anthony has said. But within that, you need to make sure that you've got a plan A, B or C because it, you might have to go off task and you shouldn't feel bad. About that. No, great point. Great point. And um, I think another, we had a couple of weeks ago when I was listing out all the sessions we had, one particular one was around parents and Heather's hit on it in the chat box there is around the extent, and Anthony, actually your point, like extending that fun and creativity and enjoyment of the P session at home. Uh, what Heather said there that uh, I asked about a PE teacher, I asked about PE and the teacher said to me, it was the first parent to ever ask about PE in the parents' evening. I mean, that's, it could be a, mind, a, mind, a mindset shift. It could be advertising it, having it on boards. Um, but actually, I think it's down to giving um, that creativity a chance to ooze out of the pee hole or ooze out of the, the club setting and session into somewhere really, really cool. Um, and we know kind of between that ages, maybe again to the latter part of the five, six, seven, eight um, and onwards, that you know, play is no longer the fantasy. Their their imagination is coming to life, and there's key components and elements of that. And the empathy and compassion is dripping in as they get older. Um, but the peers, as you said there, Jackie, like the peers and the relationship that they have is so important um, in in the growth and development in there and the enjoyment and kind of that that peer review. Like, are we doing okay here? Am I okay? Is is this right? Um, so yeah, really, really appreciate that. So I'm very, very mindful of time. We're coming up to three o'clock mark. We're, we're zipping through things. If um, if I could move on to the last slide, what I'd love to do is, uh, Darren, if I could bring you back to the forefront on it. We've got um, a slide that has working with five to eight, pause and think, right? The top line here, statements, again, kind of top tips leading uh, to the summary part of the session. And then the bottom part are, some key questions. Would you pick a couple out there while people are reading through them and give us a little bit of on Yeah, look, I'll, I'll always remember something that happened with me in the last few months, actually, coaching a group of five to seven year olds um, where I'd, 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 I'd planned meticulously a session. Um, I thought it went really well. The kids were really engaged. Great. I played great games, great warm up, fun. And again, I, I did what was suggested during the earlier in the session where I, I sat them all down and I said, right, what did you really enjoy about the session? And I expected them to ask, you know, the, the respond, you know, oh, this game was great, or that game was great. Two of the kids said, we loved helping you clean up and stack the cones in their colours at the end. <laughs> that was their favourite part of the session. So it, I, I had to smile. I smiled both inwardly and outwardly. And um, it really brings you back to earth as to you often... Uh, you just need to understand what, and, and, and find out what, what the kids like because, because you can miss, miss the mark. And we, we have to remember um, that, you know, are we running activities, the activities that we like doing or that might look good to onlookers or are we really considering what, what the kids like? So I've got that statement there about cognitively crouching down with, with, with the kids. Um, and, and look, you know, the next session I made up a game where the kids had to stack cones, you know, which is yeah, highly successful. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier about, you know, um, your sessions resembling child-driven play. And, and I, I, drills are something, it, my, my main coaching uh, sport is, is athletics, is, is, is track and field, of which drills traditionally are a very big part of. But, you know, I, I, a lot of track and field drills traditionally are quite bland and boring. So you really need to, to try and disguise those drills and dress them up uh, to something that's a little bit more ex exciting, but not just for this age group, but you know, for, for other age groups also, but for, particularly for this age group. And um, I, I think that's really important. We, we have to be looking down at, at those kids level and really understanding where, where they're coming from. So do we, do we really 
understand what what delights them when they when 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 they come to our house session you know what does fun mean to the kids now um i remember a few years ago and i've, I've done this regularly since i started asking uh the kids that i coached to, to go away and the next session come back with three things they most enjoy about the, the session and from that i i, I created a, a top 10 things that um the kids enjoyed and I posted it up next to the desk where I plan all my sessions and made sure I tried to include as many of those as I could and and on reflecting on each session it was quite amazing how the the sessions that you decided on reflection that were the best contained most of those fun elements and um, and, and the ones that weren't as successful can contain the least and sometimes what is fun to kids can can surprise you um, it's not necessarily you know skipping around and dancing it's it, it can be a range of things um, so it, it is worth asking I think it's also we've we've talked about asking kids at the at the at the, the end of a session what they what they uh, most enjoyed about the session. I actually like and have tried quite successfully asking at the start of the session, what would you like to be doing during this session? What are some things you hope we do? And we talked about being flexible, very quickly pivoting if you have to, have to, to, to make the session reflect what the kids are looking forward to and, and, and why, why they're there. So um, I think they're, they're some of the, the, the main things that I, I would be looking at. And you know, if you weren't there, what, what would the kids be doing? What would they decide to do? So they're really understanding your 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 audience, I suppose. Fantastic, Darren. Thank you so much. Loads of stuff coming through here, and loving the slide, loving the slide, um, and capturing some really um, key statements and visuals from that. Uh, just to throw eyes over to a couple of things that's been said here. Um, a, a funny one here from Liz. Definitely never thought I'd equate front crawl to catching and grabbing your Xbox remote and passing it back to. A until one of my kids said that's what he thought of in a game and uh, some of us may have heard of gamification coming into the session where you're you're pausing the session you're going to a next level you're beating the boss at the end of the session loads of different uh, variations of different games depending on your audience um but like i think it's um a lot of the stuff we talked about are already today even if it's five-year-olds where we may perceive that we need to be the leader for coming into that space or we need to have all the answers they probably have more answers than we do <laughs> um, around creativity and where to go and what to do and how to how to create a story as Anthony said on it um, Anthony anything to to add um, from your point of view around games or activities or even the social distancing that we talked at at the break um, one of the things I liked on the slide was how do we give children opportunities sort of in the lesson and we have a challenge Mr Lands um, and it can happen at any stage through the lesson so gymnastics is a really good one I am not the most flexible and the children know it the children know Mr Lands is not very flexible at gymnastics so they challenge me to cartwheels to forward rolls and the challenge Mr Lands is something that I I'm not an expert in, I, I can't do it. And, it. and I think the children appreciate knowing that I'm not good at it and some are better than me at it. The children love it. So that challenge Mr. Lands within the lesson is a really brilliant opportunity for the children to have that sense of pride that they're better than Mr. Lands at something. But it promotes the fun when they see me trying to cartwheel and they film it on the iPad and we slow it right down and it, oh, it's brilliant. That's a, that's a really good one for that age group using the iPad and reviewing it and making a, a show of yourself is, is, is a really good one. Challenge Mr. Land is, is a good one. And that vulnerability that comes with that. Mm. You know, it's like the doors are closed or at least the, the session has started and it's just, you know, you and, and hopefully if you have an assistant coach or some other helpers around ready to just enjoy the session. And Heather's put a really interesting point there as we're getting towards the reflective and closed part here. Recent research suggests that enjoyment is the key driver to physical literacy. Is enjoyment the same as fun? Um, we've done a lot of work. Um, Heather and I fortunately had a good, a good chunk of time last year together to try and dissect, disseminate, go through the different parts of the country and ask this question. And actually, at all age groups, it changes, doesn't it? And I think that's a really interesting point she's made there is, is fun one particular part of enjoyment? Um, and I think with the group that we have here today, um, what you said, the, one of the things that comes back to me is noticing and asking questions, observing what's happening, the patterns, asking the questions and being um, creative. And I don't, I'm not alluding to uh, smiles equally sign fun all the time. Um, 
but understanding what kind of what the, the baseline norms are for that age group that you have in front of you at that time and continuing on. Um, I saw you nodding and smiling there, Darren. Does that uh, hit, hit, hit a point with you? Yeah, because because when 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 you ask kids what 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 fun means, there there is a range of of of, of responses, um, and and that's what we have have to be aware of. Like I said, we when 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 we think of fun, you know, it it, it isn't just mucking around, is it? It's 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 it can be, you know, a kid a kids might say, well, I really enjoy, um, you know, in in their own language, being challenged, or you know, I like being. Um, with with my friends, or you know, it's it, it, it's a range of things. Yes, yeah, absolutely. There's a really interesting podcast. Um, Amanda Vizek is the uh, Dr. Amanda Vizek is over in um, uh, the United States doing some research on how athletes define fun, um, and goes in. I think her first she did it a couple of times over a, a portion of two years, but it was eighty components that she came up with and uh, competition was uh, further down the list. Um, but yeah, really, really interesting to have a pause moment around that. Jackie, any thoughts, any closing thoughts on today's session? If I was to ask you maybe to, to put a, a summary sentence out there for us, what would it be? What would you like everyone here today to take with them? Um, I think in relation to working with this age group, it's um, to, to get to their, get on their level. Um, so make it real to them um, and obviously keep it simple, active and engaging. Awesome words. Um, Anthony, um, for you coming through, before we go to reflective questions, a, a message that you'd like to have uh, filtered through from the session today, a key message from your experience. Um, try and be the, the fun. So as soon as they know you're coming, they've already got that smile. And the big thing for me is use language that they can physically see. I think that's a good message for me. Darren? Yeah, I think just being really empathetic um, with the kids and trying to see see the things th through, through their eyes. I, I always use the statement that good coaches are, are child-centred rather than self-centred. Oh, nice one, absolutely. And um, I think one of the things we're very mindful in the sessions that we have is is getting to a point where we're understanding, you know, people who've logged on today and given up their time, what do they really want to get out of the session today? Why did they come here? And like I've seen some brilliant questions today, some great examples shared. We will continue this over in Connected Coaches, but I would like a pause moment to maybe think of some or share some reflective questions and I'll ask our panelists and the audience to pop the questions in the chat box. What questions would you ask yourself at the end of a session? So what what questions would you ask yourself at the end of a session that would help you inform the next is it coaching club session? Is it a school PE session? Um, is it a group session like a multi sport question? So Darren, yeah, you can go first there. Yeah, one one thing that I, I find really handy to ask yourself is: Have you interacted with each of the children in in the session? Have, have you used their names? Have, have it, it's a very very interesting thing to look to look back upon. And when we're talking about that relationship building that's that's so important between the teacher or coach and the kids, uh, it, it, it can surprise you when 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 you think back and you think, did I actually say something to that child during during that session? I, I think it's a really important one. Love it, absolutely. Um, Anthony? Um, I think for me, it's giving the children opportunities. We spoke about it, giving them opportunities to take their own learning somewhere. So one of the questions they ask is, so we'll put a whiteboard up where they just go and scribble pictures on. So it's, did they use that? That's the key thing for me. So when you talk about engagement, again, that is a completely different size. That one child, could they just scribble? There's a picture of them in their zombie position on the board. So that that would be the key thing that... I'd look for at the end. Absolutely. I, I remember myself even just having multiple whiteboards around a session um, and encouraging the teacher who was maybe again nervous to embrace in different um, different ways of managing the class the, away from the classroom in the PE hall or in the field. And it was having a multitude. So at one point, which I think Greg alluded to earlier, where you have somebody who's maybe um, 
not as extrovert in nature behavior. They just sit and draw for a second, or they might write a couple of words down, or they might draw what's happening and then engage when they're ready. So having opportunities, or um, just on the ta on the back of what you said the last time, Anthony, just in including everyone around you. If it is in a school setting, having a teaching assistant who's in the room to jump in, or if you are fortunate enough to have an assistant coach or anybody else is helping and learning. Once you know they've ticked all the the safeguarding boxes and GPS and stuff, engage in the session support and help what role what are they seeing you know can they help out in a different way so everyone's part of this enjoyable experience um jackie any questions from you um, like um, question? the, um the laughometer um so <laughs> in regard to the gauge of fun and enjoyment so it'd be like the noise i know anthony and i about noise on um friday in regard to the noise in the room and what, what that noise looks like um, so is the noise fun and engaging? So I'd have my um, laughometer um, and also mess. Don't be afraid of mess. I think sometimes coaches or teachers like everything to be laid out nice and neatly. In regard to this age group, mess is good. Mess is good. Brilliant. So gathering loads of summaries, there's some load of questions that have gone in the chat box and obviously this recording will be available for people on Connected Coaches. Some questions from a reflective point of view that I wrote down is if it isn't in a school setting where they have to go to be like, why did they come there? You know, who's, 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 have they been brought there because somebody wants them to be better at something or do they actually want to be there? What would they like to be doing? I think, uh, Anthony, maybe you said that earlier on, like if they weren't here, <laughs> what would they be doing? Um, and what do they need from me? Um, taking a pause moment where you are, as Greg said, like, did you end up as a guest in their practice? So they're all there. <laughs> and what role did you play on that day? So uh, without drowning yourself and in, in, in overanalyzing the uh, the session that you've had, because you really do want to enjoy it. Um, but I think there's an ocean of different practical examples that we've covered here today. And we are very mindful that we are returning to COVID or post-ish COVID training. And there's loads of implications into training. So we will connect um, the our three wonderful panelists today with the stuff in the chat box and some key teams into our communities of practice to bring this to life. And um, if there's any other examples that come out uh, that people have put together or even noticed in the last couple of weeks and return to play, return to train that we can include. So super important. But um, I would like to ask the chat box just one word to describe the session, please, for you today. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left before we close it off and um, look at the last couple of slides. So if I could ask the group there one one other um, one other word to help us gather what your thoughts are on the session, because you're so important to us. Getting a feel of, you know, you've given up your hour today. Our wonderful panelists have given up their hour and gathered all their experience. I'm sure they have multiple hours planning, writing notes. It's almost midnight and Darren's still awake, using his free pair of time um, to, to enlighten us. So informative, interesting, practical, useful. It's so important that our guests get um, that feedback as well. And after this session, in a couple of minutes, we'll go um, as a whole team in UK coaching and do that plan, do review. How has the session been today? How was the planning for it? What will we, um, you know, adapt, change, um, tweak for next week to, to move it on? Physical language, thought provoking, and there was loads of phrases there um, that we use: structured, unstructured, selling a lifelong participation, um, noticing loads of key words, um, along with the, the different areas of development: social, mental, and emotional. So um, thank you so much. We've got a search that you can log into the website and have a look at. Um, it's there every week for you to, to tap in and just put in the code. The link is there. There's also some brilliant sessions. We're going up an age group next week. Nick is going to host and navigate that, um, our 9 to 12 year olds. Um, we've got some wonderful guests lined up for that. So keep an eye out on social media. Um, so, oh, there's our, our big loud hailer, coaching 9 to 11s, and then into coaching teenagers. Um, in our first week of September after the bank holiday. So thank you so much to everybody who's logged on today and a massive thank you to our panelists today for giving us your insight. I knew from all the different lenses and experience that it was going to be really insightful. I tried to take some notes, but I was too engaged in the conversation in the chat box. So <laughs> I have to go and do some reflection on the session myself. So uh, thank you to everybody. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the session and anything else that we need to check out, you can get it from Connected Coaches. So Anthony, Jackie and Darren, thank you so much.